attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar. We're so glad you could join us today. I'm Anita Sedgwick, Director of Marketing and Sales at Usability Matters, and I will be hosting our new webinar series, Putting Users in UX. While lots of people are responsible for creating user experiences, we are continuously surprised by how few take the time to involve users in that process. So that's the point of this series, to introduce you to research methods that bring your audience, the people that will be using your product, your technology or services into the design process. We see far too many products going to market without the right level of research and insights to ensure real success in the marketplace. Today in episode one, we start with research methods and strategy. This is where Terry and Steven dive into the way you need to start generating ideas and imagining the future of your app, website, or other digital products. In episode two, Wednesday, May 27th, we'll examine the research methods for design. Here's where we will focus on ways to collaborate on design with your stakeholders and audiences and as well as dive into some of the evaluation methods. And in episode three, um, we will uh, learn more about the important mechanics of planning, conducting, and analyzing your research. We hope you'll join us for all of these. For those of you who don't know us, Usability Matters is a strategy, research, and design studio located in Toronto. Global organizations for over 13 years continue to lean on our team of experts to deliver remarkable design experiences through rigorous research, beautiful design, and a relentless focus on the needs of the user. Before we start getting into the real reason why you're here, I'd like to highlight a couple of housekeeping items. We'll be covering a lot of information today. Don't worry about taking notes. We will be emailing you the link with the slides and the full recording. Also, we will be watching the panel on our screens for any questions that you might have. So we'll be sure to address those um, as soon as we can um, and during the Q&A sessions. Now I'll introduce you to our presenters for today and throughout the series. Terry Costantino is one of the principals at Usability Matters and Stephen LeMay is a UX practitioner who has been with Usability Matters for almost all of its 13 years. I'm gonna turn it over to Terry to get us started. Thanks, Anita. To get us all on the same page, I'm going to start with a bit of background, starting with what we mean by user experience and the UX process, and then a little bit about types of research and the research process. Then we'll discuss some research methods for strategy in detail, uh, contextual inquiry, interviews, surveys, focus groups, and World Cafe. The aim is to help you understand these research methods, when to use them, and most importantly, why you might want to use them. So user experience, or UX, is a term that describes a person's overall satisfaction with a product or service. And we see here a definition from Nielsen Norman Group. It's important because if it's a good experience, people leave happy. If it's a bad experience, they don't come back, and they tell their friends, and maybe they tell Google, and that's not good. Research feeds into all the phases of the UX process, strategy, design, and development. During strategy, sometimes called discovery, we figure out why we are trying, uh, sorry, what we are trying to accomplish, why we're doing it, and who we're doing it for. We'll look at a number of research methods that answer these what, why, and who questions in more detail today. In the design phase of a project, we figure out how the UX will unfold. There are a number of ways to bring users into the design phase, and we'll examine some of those methods in the second episode of the series in May. One of those is usability testing, and you'll notice it appears in all three phases. Uh, in strategy, we may test the current version of a product as an input to the design of the next version, or we might, make, uh, we might do the testing in order to make a business case for the need to do a redesign. During design, we uh, often do usability testing of the new design, which of course has the greatest impact on it. And in production, we may, uh, in production, we may do usability testing as part of user acceptance testing or as an input to iterative, iterative design improvements. So we'll go into depth about usability testing in the next episode, 
So we won't be covering it to, in any more depth today. Uh, we also won't be covering heuristic evaluation in detail. It's similar to usability testing, but rather than reviewing with representative users, we do an expert review. One or two usability specialists will undertake common tasks and document the usability barriers and possible solutions. So we will be talking about the other five methods that you see in bold, and, uh, we, but we have included all seven in a, a handy summary guide that we'll be providing to you later. So before we dive into the methods, I, I want to make clear uh, that all the methods that we'll be discussing in this series are qualitative research methods. There are lots of differences between quantitative and qualitative research, but in the simplest terms, quantitative research results in numbers and qualitative research results in words. They, have, they answer different kinds of questions, as you can see here, what versus why. They have different purposes generalizability, prediction, and causal explanations are usually why someone undertakes quant quantitative research, whereas qualitative research is more exploratory and helps us understand the participant's perspective. The researcher also takes a different role, an objective observer in quantitative and an empathetic participant in qualitative. And the setting is often also different, so a controlled environment versus a naturalistic environment. And finally, because one uh, quantitative results in numbers, you can do st statistical analysis, whereas qualitative analysis is interpretive. This slide shows the difference between the two approaches. And uh, actually, I should have mentioned that the reason that it's great to uh, have both quantitative and qualitative is that they work really well together. They're both useful and they're just different. And they're especially useful when they're used in complementary ways. So this slide shows the difference between the two approaches. Quantitative research usually starts with a theory and hypothesis and then tests it. As mentioned, qualitative is more exploratory. So it starts with observation, looks for patterns, and then forms hypothesis or theory. So starting with qualitative research can lead to questions or hypotheses or even theories that can be validated with quantitative research. Where starting with quantitative research, we can learn what is happening and use qualitative research to investigate why. And why is the rich, messy, emotional human part that is needed to form a meaningful product or project strategy. And that's why it usably matters. We focus on qualitative research and that's why we'll be looking at qualitative research methods in this series. No matter what type of research you're doing, these are the key steps in the process. Determine the research objective, plan, recruit, conduct, and analyze and report. When we work with clients, we suggest they write down all the things they'd like to know about their product. Some are very tactical, like is that button in the right place? And some are very conceptual. Do my clients understand my service? We then help them by grouping and prioritizing the questions and suggest one or more approaches to answering those questions. And we'll dig into this further and cover the rest of these steps in episode three in June. For the re remainder of today's webinar, we're gonna focus on research methods from our UX toolbox that are appropriate for strategy phase of a project. We're going to introduce these, each of these methods talk about how, when, and why to use them, and hopefully give you the confidence to work with them in your own UX efforts. So my colleague, Stephen, will start us off with contextual inquiry. Fantastic, thank you, Terry. Um, so yeah, we, we're gonna talk about a, a bunch of different uh, research methods now, and get our hands a little bit dirty with those, and contextual inquiry is where we'd like to start. Sometimes the environment in which a product or service is used can have a profound effect on human behavior. It affects product usability and it impacts what we learn when conducting research. So contextual inquiry, really a fancy term for observing how people use a, a product or service in a natural setting or context in which it's normally used, um, is a method that allows us to account for the impact that the setting or contact context has on the user experience. So if you anticipate that the setting may affect your product or service, 
Contextual inquiry is essential. Here in this photograph, my con colleague Simon um, is not simply being a big kid in the little kid's play area. This photo is from some contextual inquiry that we did with the Toronto Public Library. Contextual inquiry was essential in our work with the Toronto Public Library. It shaped our understanding of the parents and children who use the library and what we should be designing for kids online. Contextual inquiry shaped our strategy in several ways. So for example, parents and kids, we knew and we saw, love the story time programs in library branches. By observing these story time programs, we learned that helping parents gain the confidence to read and to sing and to play with their kids was essential to promoting early literacy. The success of these programs comes not from teaching parents how to teach their kids to read, but from modeling the fun interactions that foster early language skills. So modeling over teaching became a key tenet of our strategy. We also learned that kids weren't the only ones who were learning language skills in story time programs. Often, it was parents or caregivers who were also improving their English. And this important observation directly impacted our persona development and our understanding of the audience and how we could uh, provide the best user experience for them online. So another method that we uh, frequently use in the strategy phase is interviews. And when we talk about interviews, we really are talking about structured conversations. They're really, it's a simple method and they should feel informal, but they are not simply chit chat. Interviews are built upon a solid research plan. It's important to pinpoint the issues and the topics that you want to explore, and then craft a discussion guide that will lead to answers for your questions. Now, interviews are generally conducted early in the process. They help to generate ideas, to establish constraints, and to challenge preconceived notions. And we use this method often to get inside users' heads, to learn how they think about something. It can provide uh, often more depth and more color than you would get from a survey, for example. An example uh, on a recent project um, that we were doing for a B2B service, our, our client knew that there was something confusing for their customers um, and trying to figure out which phone number they should call for which type of service, you know, one type of service versus another, or support versus sales, or small businesses versus large one, and so forth. But they thought it was really just a minor irritant for, for their customers. By conducting interviews with these customers, it became apparent that the issue was actually having a much greater and much more significant impact uh, than our client had imagined. The color brought about by the voices of real customers was essential in prioritizing improvements to the overall service, uh, and, uh, service design and strategy. Interviews can contribute to your strategy in lots of ways, and they can help you understand the context for users' activities, to better understand users' goals and their priorities, and uh, they often dispel myths about users. So a good place to start is by exploring the purpose of the interview. The types of questions you'll be asking uh, and what you'll be doing with the results. Then as a courtesy, Ask if the participant has any questions before you begin. Once the groundwork is laid, start by building trust and rapport with the participant. And an easy uh, question often gets the ball rolling and puts the participant at ease. In the recent B2B customer interviews I mentioned a moment ago, we got the ball rolling with uh, a lighthearted question 
asking participants what a typical business day looked like for them. And most people laughed and said that there was no such thing as a typical day. The humor in this question allowed them to paint a much more descriptive picture of their job rather than just listing off their official responsibilities. Now, a good discussion guide is essential. The guide prevent, provides a, an overall structure for your questions and helps ensure that you get the information that you need. The conversation may stray, and in fact, we often encourage it uh, to stray in many interesting directions. Um, and the discussion guide is a tool for uh, not only keeping the, the conversation flowing, should it get quiet, uh, but also for bringing it back on track when it does stray into those uh, interesting other directions. A good overall uh, structure often starts with general questions at the beginning, then more detailed questions once the conversation gets rolling, and finally taper off to general questions at the end. So I think we were going to pause here for to check to see if there were any questions. Mm -hmm. Anita, uh, has anybody chimed in with questions that we wanted to address at this point? Um, yeah, we have one really interesting question from one of our attendees. In fact, uh, we'd really like to know um, why it is useful to involve users in strategy. Yes, well, as I think, uh, as we mentioned, um, what you can get from uh, users during strategy is ideas about uh, where the product needs to go, whether it's understood long before you get to the design phase. So you, a lot of the conceptual questions can be uh, asked at that point uh, and, and explored, and sometimes even to possibly uh, to prioritize amongst, you know, the, the team might have a lot of ideas about where they want the product to go. And uh, so involving users early on can help prioritize those as well. Yep. We talked a little bit about challenging preconceived notions. Uh, so any project starts somewhere with a business idea, but sometimes those business ideas are internally generated and haven't really been being vetted beyond the internal team. So um, this kind of research that brings the users in helps to make sure the strategy is actually a sound one. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we often find uh, early on in the strategy phase is that the notions that uh, our customers may have about their users may be pretty sketchy or sometimes in some cases have very little flesh on the bones at all. So we want to bring users into the research, uh, the research and strategy uh, so that we have a really great idea of who it is we're designing for when we get to design. Great. Okay. And so we're going to uh, move on to surveys now. And uh, so surveys are, of course, structured questions, and they can be for very few people or for very many people. Uh, surveys can be crafted to be qualitative or quantitative research. So if the purpose is to count responses and reach a generalizable conclusion, so quantitative, then the structure of the survey and who participates in the first survey must be strictly controlled so the results will be statistically significant. However, in qualitative research, the questions can be less structured and the purpose is to gain insights, not numerical data. Surveys are often a standalone method uh, when we want to involve a greater number of people than can be reached by interview. Surveys can be incorporated into other methods as well, so they can be part of an interview or a part of a contextual inquiry or a part of a usability test. Another common use for surveys uh, that we use is to um, register or pre-qualify participants for usability testing or another study. So we'll get people to uh, respond to an, a link usually and fill out a few questions that tell us who they are, a little bit about their behavior, um, and also about their availability so we can schedule them in to uh, participate in a study. So online surveys are great for gathering input from a greater number of people, regardless of time or location. So that's great. They can do it in their essentially in their own time. In, input can be highly structured or it can be entirely open to fit the need of the research. And depending on the questions, the outputs of the survey 
can also be highly structured. So we may represent those graphically in some basic charts or infographics, but we would normally steer clear, as I mentioned earlier, of counts, because what we're trying to get out of this is insights. So by their very nature, surveys are flexible. They can be delivered online by personal invitation or to random people who visit a website. They can be conducted live or in person or by mail. When crafting a survey, it's important to be very clear about the objectives, with it, as with any method, and then be really creative about how to present a set of questions that will meet those objectives. You also need to determine who you want to respond to the survey and how many responses you want, or at least how long you want to have the survey in play. Sometimes you run a survey for a week so that it will catch most people at some point in that week. Other times we determine that we will close the survey once we get 200 completions. And 200 is not a perfect number. That's just an example. And, uh, you know, it's impo again, important to remember that qualitative research is about getting enough input to generate insights. So who you want to respond to the survey will drive other decision decisions, such as the method of delivering the survey, how you will recruit the respondents, as well as driving the questions themselves. So um, before you make the survey available to your audiences, you need to test it thoroughly and also run a pilot with a few respondents who, will, who were not involved in creating the survey. And once the survey has started, monitor the responses to make sure there are no problems with the content or technology. One time we stopped a survey on the first day because respondents were misunderstanding one question. We could tell by how they were responding. So we deleted all the responses from that day fix the question and start it again. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just important to monitor. And we use uh, SurveyMonkey for most of our online surveys, but there are plenty of other similar software services. For the most part, they make it easy to create, test, fix, and extract the data from surveys. However, there's certainly an art to interpreting the data, and it is closely related to the art of crafting the objectives as well as crafting the survey questions. So if you've never created or analyzed a survey, it's great if you can work alongside someone who has some experience, at least on your first couple of surveys. So we like to start with some easy to answer questions, like simple multiple choice questions, like this one here. It's a little out of context, but I think you get the picture. It's a multiple choice, we've all been there. Uh, or we use brief open-ended questions as well. So doing these early can help get respondents spontaneous thoughts and language, which we can which can be really helpful when considering what to label elements in the design later. So we don't want to show them language. Um, rather, we'd like to get their own spontaneous language. And then we move towards more complex questions like ranking seen here. And you can see that the person pulls down and decides one, two, three, four, which one is most important to them. And then uh, rating scale is another kind of question. And you can see it here from not important to ex extremely important. And then matrix questions where they can get a little bit more complex where you're asking people how many times have you done this thing and et cetera, et cetera. So they can get really complicated. So you want the questions to flow though as naturally as you can. And in fact, almost mimicking an interview. So, they, so that the questions feel related and they build on one another. At, the, at or near the end, we often include another open-ended question to capture any thoughts that didn't fit into the more structured questions. Open-ended questions are valuable, but you have to use them carefully since many respondents may not take the time to answer numerous essay-style questions. And open-ended questions generate a lot of data to analyze, which is great, but it's also really time-consuming. So before you make the survey available to your audiences, right, as I mentioned previously, it's good to run a pilot and, uh, and then also to uh, organize your data in ways that you can easily, um, that you can easily uh, analyze. Okay, so now we're going to move on to focus groups. And uh, this is gathering input from small groups. And it's a technique that uh, really helps to uncover opinions and feelings about, it, about a topic. It has traditionally been part of the market research toolkit, but it can have its place in UX strategy too. 
Rather than just gathering opinions, we use them to gather group knowledge, creating a space where participants can collaborate on the vision for a product or service together. We also use them in collaborative design methods, which is one of the methods we're going to talk about in the next installment on research methods for design. It's useful to use uh, focus groups early in a process when high level opinions and collaboration can shape the project's vision. So this answers a little bit that question we heard earlier. It's also useful to challenge preconceived notions as, as, as Stephen also mentioned. The value of focus groups comes from the interaction of the participants and their reactions to each other's opinions and their opportunities to work together. In a typical focus group, a small number of people gather around a table to discuss topics and questions posed by a moderator. A virtual gathering works too, and, we, and we've run some, but in-person is preferred due to the richness of the nonverbal communication. Physical gestures like eye rolling, arm crossing, leaning in, pushing away from the table are great cues to spark deeper questions. Often a formal research facility is used in order to accommodate observers behind a one-way glass. This allows project stakeholders to see and hear their customers firsthand before the research findings are analyzed or reported on. Due to the group dynamic, it can be a real challenge to keep the discussion both free-ranging and focused. A well-planned discussion guide is essential. The entire session may be a group discussion, or there may be segments where you ask the participants to work individually, in pairs, or in small groups. Your session may include the introduction of artifacts, materials, and probes, so these will need to be carefully considered and created in advance. So running a pilot, pilot is always useful even if it's with quite a small number of people. Coming out of the focus groups, you should have a much better understanding of your audiences, their feelings about the topic, and or their feelings about the artifacts you introduced. And if you've included a collaborative element to your focus group, you may have some new artifacts that you need to interpret. Great, so now I'm gonna turn it over to Steven to talk about World Cafe. The methods we've talked about so far today are pretty familiar to, to many people, at least by name. The World Cafe is a little bit different. This may not be quite so familiar. Um, so hopefully this will be um, interesting. The World Cafe is a really fabulous technique for gathering input from a large group of people in a very short period of time. A single afternoon is ideal. As you might have guessed from the name, um, it, it really is a cafe-like setting. So in a large organization, um, we might want to employ this method because parts of an organization may have very different needs from each other, or they may think that their needs are unique, in part because they don't often get a chance to share them with each other. The World Cafe allows people not only to have input uh, into the process, but also to hear each other's voices and each other's needs. It's also a very efficient way to gather lots of input in a very short period of time. So as you can see in this photo, what you might do is set up a number of tables, cafe style, in a large room, and you get six to eight participants per table, and you can regulate that just by the number of chairs, and each table has a facilitator. After about 10 minutes, the group at each table breaks up and everyone moves to a new table. The idea here is to mix up the, the participation at each table and not move as a group. You get one question per table. So those questions might be things like, how does the current website help or hinder your users? What are some of your peers or competitors doing really well? Or blue sky, if there were no constraints, Describe the ideal website for your organization. And then you ask people to write one thought per sticky note. And once the participants have visited each table, they break off for coffee and a snack. And during this break, the facilitators take 10 or 15 minutes to very quickly summarize the key points that we have heard. The group then uh, reassembles as a whole and the summaries are presented back to the group. And this pres presenting back to the group uh, is really terrific because it demonstrates to the participants that they have indeed been heard by us uh, and that we've been listening careful, 
carefully, um, and it provides a great wrap up uh, for everyone so they feel that they've been involved in the process. And out of this process comes lots and lots of data in the form of sticky notes. Initially, the sticky notes are or arranged by question, as you can see here. And then we start combing through those sticky notes, um, and the analysis begins. We look for common themes and patterns, um, and we do that by shuffling them around until we've grouped them by theme. And out of this grouping and analysis, comes a, a broad set of features and requirements. And the fantastic thing is that this set of features and requirements all ties directly back to the people who participated in the World Cafe. So there you have it, five methods uh, from, from the, the strategy phase. Um, this particular table that we're looking at here uh, is a handy one-page chart that we've put together that compares uh, some of the research methods for strategy. Uh, and uh, Anita will be distributing this after today's webinar. So no need to read all the details and fine print here just now. But really, it's a great what, why, when, and where cheat sheet for the methods we talked about today, plus a couple of additional ones that we hope you'll find useful. All right. Perfect. Thank you very much. Stephen, Terry, that was a very, very helpful session. We do have a bunch of questions from the audience. We're going to uh, try to cover off a few. Uh, first question that came in uh, was from Leah. Leah would like to know what age group would be appropriate for user interviews? Well, pretty much any age group where um, you've got somebody who can speak. Uh, in fact, there are ways to conduct research, you know, even with uh, pre-speaking uh, children, um, or even with with adults who have impairments that you know, can't speak. Um, but there are different approaches that you need to take when you're when you're dealing with kids. You, you need to you know, consent uh, and adult supervision, uh, caretaker supervision, par parental approval. All of those kinds of things are essential. Um, and the kinds of questions and the way that you would word them would be different depending on age group and cognitive abilities. And um, cognitive abilities would not be a term that we'd use with uh, kids in the room, for example. Um, so there's really no uh, lower limit, but you do need to tailor the, the approach and the questions to the age group. And uh, some of the interviews that uh, Stephen mentioned earlier uh, for the Toronto Public Library, he actually conducted them in small family groups. So the child uh, was present, the parent uh, would answer, say, the lion's share of the questions, but the, the child was there um, able to chime in, and in fact, some of the questions were directed to them. So there's a bunch of methods that you can use, but it's an excellent, excellent question. Yeah. And in that case, the questions that were directed to the children were most often directed to the children by the parents. Uh, so we would ask the parents something about their child's behavior, and the parent would then validate that with the, with the child. It's really wonderfully rich that way. Perfect. All right, we have another question from Jean Christophe. Uh, he would like to know, in B2C interviews, is it good to go outside and ask the target audience uh, hold on, I'm going to pull up the rest of the question. Target the audience that is available on the streets, or is it better to only use a more structured interview process? Well, that depends on who you need. You've determined in your uh, in your planning you want to actually interview. So we've done lots of uh, structured interviews with people in their offices. We've done them over the phone. Um, We've done them in person, and in fact, we've even done things like run it onto the street in front of our own office building to grab people off the street where that was appropriate. But you need to determine that as part of your research plan. And we've talked about the research plan a number of times today, and, and that's uh, actually going to be something that we talk about in episode three of this series in more detail. So how do you put that plan together to make sure you're recruiting the right person. Yeah, the plan really drives 
Um, you know, it has to include those objectives that I mentioned earlier and, um, and then drives a lot of those decisions about how you're going to intercept people, essentially. And uh, nothing wrong with, uh, with a, a, a less formal approach. Again, um, we're not trying to become statistically valid, so you don't have to look, you know, every third person. You can grab every single person um, and, uh, you know, and, and get some responses from them. So it's great to consider less formal methods. Okay, great. We have another question from Krista. Krista would like to know, um, in terms of involving users in the research, can I also can I also help raise sorry involving users in the research can also help raise different scenarios and questions for researches. Um, okay, so sorry that I'm not understanding that question. So I'm going to go to the next one. Um, yeah, I think we can. Okay, I yeah, think, you can. I think that yeah, if I understand the question correctly, okay. um, yes, for sure, doing research brings up lots of ideas for additional research. Um, of course, every project and client has a limited amount of time and money for such research. So uh, we would put some of that on the back burner. We might come back to certain ideas that we learned uh, early and circle back in another round of research later. So if I'm understanding the, the uh, question correctly, I would agree that um, uh, of course it does. And then we often, almost every method that we use, we will have what appears to be a kind of a casual conversation with users uh, early on in the method in order to, as I mentioned before, get some of their spontaneous language and that sort of thing. And for sure, they bring up scenarios that are eye-opening to the client. Yeah, we in the strategy part of an engagement, that's really important for us to uncover. We want to learn those additional uh, scenarios that might not have been preconceived. And it's interesting that in some cases, there's some hesitant on, hesitation on the part of clients to examine um, scenarios that they hadn't already had in mind. We as external experts can come in and put them on the table, but if we've got those voiced in, uh, in the voice of their customers, that carries much more weight. Right. So yeah. those new scenarios that come up through research in the strategy phase, that's gold. We want that. Right. Yeah. That's a good point. Okay. We have another question. Do you consider users who are not very familiar with using websites or apps or computers and or or other types of uh, similar products? So we we again as part of that plan upfront of who you're trying to get to, and um, so sometimes we you know, say to clients, are you actually wanting to teach people the web? And the answer on most cases is no. So we'll look for a baseline of familiarity. Uh, and often our clients want a mix of people. Uh, it's harder and harder to determine what exactly how savvy somebody is because we all have uh, our very own unique experiences. And so we've definitely uh, run into people who uh, we're very, very experienced uh, on, say, using a computer and using the web, but yet there was one little thing that they'd never encountered before. So, so we just try to mix it up for the most part. But then we have had cases, for example, we worked on a, a, a website for people with a very low literacy, and we did some recruitment and research with them. So that was pretty specific stuff. And, uh, and of course, revealed a lot of interesting things. We had designed the site for, for that very purpose, but like any other test, they revealed to us some of the places where there were some barriers for them. Okay, great. Uh, Kate would like to know, uh, if you are working on redesigning an existing software product, is it useful to test users on the current software when the new design will be so different? Or would it be better to simply survey or interview users for more opinion-based data? Well, th there have been occasions when it's been uh, really valuable for us to do uh, a particular method in strategy to help assess a current product. So that might be usability testing. Um, and that, you know, a case that comes to, to mind was one where um, the, the entire process of bringing new customers on board 
was known to be problematic, but there wasn't a great deal of confidence about what was it in the pro process that really needed to be fixed in the next immediate rounds. So the only way to, to get that kind of tactical information was to do some usability testing. Um, in other cases, uh, we might not want to be so tactical, and so usability testing might not be the technique for version two of a product. We want to be more exploratory about what are the next needs of our uh, audience. We might choose a different method. Yep. Okay, great. Sergio would like to know, do you have to define your marketing persona before or after the interview? Well, these are the well, methods. It's more we like before and after. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, you know, we talked about preconceived notions. So very often we are, we're involved in a project where um, our client might think they have a really good idea of who their audience is, and we find out through the research that they're actually mistaken on a couple of key points, or there's a different angle to it, or a completely different type of audience they haven't uh, considered yet. So the strategy would help lead to revised personas or profiles. In some cases, one of the key outputs of the strategy phase is the creation of those personas the first time you know, uh, from scratch. So we might start with some uh, outlines of personas based on the first step of research and then validate that and challenge it in subsequent types of research, flesh it out, add more to it as we dive into um, the next set of research. So it can even the you know, creation of personas can be an iterative process. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Uh, we have another, lots of really great questions coming in, by the way. We're going to try to cover off a few more and then we will probably need to sign off. Uh, what are some good techniques to convince management of the importance, or I'm just getting arrested, the importance of user testing? Well, the one I used for a long time, because it seemed to resonate, especially with some of the big brands, was you wouldn't put anything else out to market without some market research. So even though usability, or sorry, uh, user experience uh, uh, research is a little different than market research, and I would make the distinction that market research is more about uh, opinion and user experience is, a, is more about behavior, but nonetheless, it's a term they're familiar with. So especially before people started, you know, companies started to be a little more wise to user experience, uh, I would just say, look, it's just one more thing in your marketing portfolio, and of course we're going to test it, right? right? And not even sort of giving them a chance to wiggle out of it. So uh, an interesting little caveat came in. Uh, what about if it's a non-for-profit? Um, well, again, we try to be really sensitive. So there's all kinds of not-for-profits, as we as we well know. Some are large and well-funded, and some are small and less well-funded. So we always try to, I mean, that's one of the factors of the plan, right, is that we need to know how much time and, and, and budget and, and also um, resources on the client side are available to participate in this in the research effort. Mm -hmm. So we would tailor the research effort around what was available, that's for sure. Um, but in terms of um, the uh, making clear the value of it for a nonprofit, I don't think it's that different, really. No, it's not. The thing that might be you know, different in that conversation is around budget for research. And so we might choose different approaches to research um, to, for a particular budget. And that's an all, you know, often the case with a not-for-profit. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yep, fair point. Okay. Do you recommend asking clients to think of themselves as customers and to interview them as such that is from a customer's point of view? We, we do interview many people that are considered uh, customers or stakeholders, and we do get their input on what they think users think, <laughs> whether we want it or not sometimes. Um, but we, we have never taken the tactic of getting them to pretend that they're a user because they just they just have such a different vested interest in the product that I'm not sure that they could, you know, you need to be very careful about 
how you interpreted what they said, I'd say. One of the key things we want to do in strategy is to help our customers understand their clients better, their audience better, you know, not necessarily clients. Um, and in the process of doing that, we want to help foster a, a, an empathy with our audience. So it's not quite impersonating our audience, but it's having a greater sense of who they are and being able to understand them better, that sense of empathy. So we might do different activities that ask people to you know, leave your own needs behind and imagine you're doing this on behalf of somebody else. So take taking one's self out of the equation. And that's particularly important when we get into the design phase where we want to make sure our design decisions are uh, based on um, the people, the real audience, and not our own specific uh, needs. So an example of that kind of activity might be um, you know, based on what you know from your um, uh, customer service people and the pain points they, they've pointed out, let's undertake an activity that is you know, a, a breakup letter with your company. Here's why I'm leaving your company. So it takes the, the, the dry uh, statistics out of the Excel spreadsheet and re-encapsulate it into, yeah. into a real person's voice. Mm -hmm. So it's an exercise in empathy, it's an exercise in understanding, um, but it's not really impersonation. Mm -hmm. Would you say that uh, putting some of that human voice behind it might also help with that buy-in? It does, because the moment we can encourage people to see things from a different perspective, light bulbs start going mm -hmm. on. Yep. Yep, that's a good point. All right, just a couple more questions. There's a lot coming in. How can we survey pain points is one good question that's come in. Interesting. I'm not sure I completely understand the question, but um, it's always it's always tricky, right? So if you, if you think you've got some pain points, uh, then it, in, a, in, a already, in a product that's already online, and digital, then you might choose to have a, a survey questions that are contextual as they are leaving, say, that process or screen. So uh, sort of an interstitial survey, you can make it very lightweight, a, a question or two, um, or you might on exit of their entire experience intercept them then, I guess. Um, but yeah, I mean, the team very, very often during strategy, the team is trying to fix, identify pain points. Um, and uh, survey might not be the first method that comes springing to mind for that sort of thing. Maybe not for pinpointing them, but certainly for prioritizing them. Mm -hmm. So we can ask people to rank what's uh, you know, the worst thing about this or what caused you the most hesitation when you did this? The retrospective analysis isn't always good, but um, we, we can ask people to rank you know, what's, what's more important to them, what kinds of issues they've had most often. Um, if they had uh, a, a pot of you know, $50 that they could spend on fixing these three problems, how would they allocate that amount of money. So that kind of ranking uh, is something that come up, can come out of a survey uh, to help prioritize yeah, those issues. Are, yeah, really good point, Stephen. Mm -hmm. Okay, last question, and we're going to sign off. In your opinion, are anomalies and surveys to be disregarded or worth exploring? Uh, That's a common question, isn't it? It's a great it? question, and not only yeah. for surveys, because you'll see anomalous behavior in usability testing. Uh, you might have one person mention something in an interview. It's a great question. And, and because uh, we are talking about qualitative methods, uh, I would say that 
the team. So we always create a team with our with members of, of Usability Matters and our client teams. Uh, we become one team when we're working together. And it's really what resonates with that team, I think, right? So sometimes we'll um, we'll see one answer and but nonetheless, you know, three or four people, light bulbs will go off and say, you know what, that's a great point. I and it feels like a, a common insight's been generated, even though only one person mentioned it. So sometimes it can be really uh, valuable, but we would always keep in mind that it was, you know, it only came up once so far. Um, but uh, other times it just feels anomalous and we leave it out of the equation. So asking that question, that very question, you know, is this anomalous response uh, something we should be interested in, is exactly the kind of question that we would ask over and over again. We want to pick that question up and look at it and say, you know, is there something interesting about this? And if the answer is yes, you know, it could be a whole new product or feature or unmet need um, that we hadn't considered before. Or it may just be somebody's had a bad day. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. Thanks so much, everybody, for listening in. We'll try to answer all the rest of the questions uh, in our follow-up uh, email and or blog post. Um, again, we will be following up with an email. We'll share the link to download this webinar. Uh, we'll also be posting a summary slide, uh, that summary slide that was referenced by Stephen. Please feel free to download that and uh, share with your colleagues and friends. Uh, this one pager is super handy and it gives you the methods that, methods you should consider or that might be best for your organization. At Usability Matters, uh, feel free to uh, log on to our, go to our website for more information on upcoming uh, events. Follow us on Twitter for continuous sort of updates and tips. And uh, LinkedIn as well is a good place to go for that. And feel free to feel, please register for the next webinar where we will focus on ways to collaborate on design with your stakeholders and audiences as well as evaluation methods. Uh, that one is uh, booked for the 27th of May. And the last of uh, episode three, we will dive into the important mechanics of planning, conducting, and analyzing your research. Please join us for all of these. Thank you very much, Stephen and Terry, for a great session. It was our pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye, all. Bye-bye.